knowledge of when they went on vacation on these traditional territory we were gathering. We recognize them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Sandy, can you please call the roll? Suella Polk. Here. Diana Armstead. Present. Brian Penoyer. Here. Michael O'Donnell. Here. Bianca Tannis. Here. Bruce Thompson. Here. Can we please stand for the pledge of the flag? have quite a few agenda changes. They're indicated in uh, yellow. We also have a couple other agenda changes that have just been added. They are not on the agenda. Uh, the uh, two agenda changes uh, that are not indicated on yellow, uh, may I have a motion to add these two additional items is 4A3, board appointment, and 4A4, the administration of oath to a new board member. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 6 0. That takes us to item number 4 ratification of the results of the 2021 election budget vote. Be resolved that the Board of Education of the New Paul Central School District ratify the voting results of the 2021 election and the budget vote held on May 18, 2021 as follows. Uh, proposition number one, shall the Board of Education of the New Paul Central School District be authorized to expend uh, $70,013,600 which will be required for school district purposes for the year July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022, and to levy the necessary tax, therefore. The, uh, there were 910 yes votes, there were 193 no votes. The uh, election for the Board of Education, uh, candidates, Glenn LaPolt, uh, 823 votes, Jessica Decker Guerrero, 465 votes. Stephanie Lyons, 501 votes. Johanna Herget, 559 votes. Heather O'Donnell, 630 votes. Diana, Diana Armistead, 550 votes. Can I have a motion to accept that? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. That's going to take us to item uh, 4A, uh, board items. Item 4A1, board, uh, board trustee resignation. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby accept the resignation of Diana Armistead for, from her current position as board trustee effective May 19, 2021. Can I have a motion to accept? To move? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Sandy? I, Diana Armstead, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of board member of the New Paltz Central School District in Falls, New York, according to the best of my ability. Diana, thank you for serving this community. My pleasure. That takes us to item uh, 4A3, board appointment. Be it resolved that the Board of Education does hereby appoint Matthew Williams to the Board of Education effective May 19, 2021 
through June 30th, uh, June 30th, 2021, to fill the vacancy created by the resignation of Board Trustee Diana Armistead. Can I have a motion to accept the appointment? So moved. Um, second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 6 0. Hi, I'm Matthew Williams, do solemnly swear that I'll support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and I'll faithfully discharge the duties of a board member of the New Baltimore School District, New Baltimore, New York, according to the best of my ability. Thank you, Matt. That is going to take us to item number five, the recognition of the 2021 valedictorian and the 2021 salutatorian. Good evening. It's my honor to recognize the achievement of one of our students this evening, our valedictorian, Ann Lennon. Anne was ex has excelled academically, maintaining an outstanding GPA as a New Falls High School student. Anne has also distinguished herself on the soccer field and has been awarded this Scholar Athlete Distinction for three years running. She has shared that she is fascinated by science and plans to pursue a major in biology in college. Anne is joined this evening by her proud parents, Sarah and John, and her sister Abigail, a graduate of the class of 2020. And we have a certificate here for you. It's a small token to mark such a major achievement. We'd like to welcome you and your family up. Uh, high school principal Mario Fernandez is also with us, and I know that he shares our wishes for your continued success. I would just like to say uh, to, to um, the Lemon family that this is such an amazing achievement. I teach in a high school. I know the competition, uh, the drive that you had to display. Uh, I'm sure that literally over the past four years, all your assignments were pretty much flawless. Uh, I want to also, you know, thank the parents for being such a great uh, support network. You know, it takes a lot for a student to achieve so much, so thank you. Our salutatorian, uh, Rachel Rankin, was unable to join us this evening, and we've invited her to our meeting on June 2nd so that we can celebrate her achievement. I look forward to sharing with you what I've learned about Rachel at our June 2nd meeting. Thank you. Thank you. That's going to take us to item number six, public comment. All right, the first public 
comment we have is from Jessica Guerrero. about an issue raised during the recent Board of Education election. I am also speaking on behalf of several community members. I didn't speak up about it while it was happening, and I apologize for that. However, several occurrences have raised questions. I'll cut right to the chase. A member of this body has publicly misrepresented a fellow board member repeatedly. repeatedly. I found it very distasteful that this BOE member broke several code of ethics best practices as laid out by the New York State Board Association and decided that they wanted to throw their influence around to target one member. The specifics of the misrepresentation are as follows. A letter was produced by a trustee naming other BOE members and admins and their supposed positions concerning school district business and intensively. This letter contained information that should not have been shared, and additionally, the letter targeted one trustee. There was additional representation around the funding of the Wellness Center. The member that was being falsely misrepresented and the majority of the BOE made the fiscally responsible decision to split the cost of the wellness center in case some unexpected emergency need came along. The BOE also decided that focusing only on the high school didn't seem fair considering the juicy playground needed updates. The BOE added some money to address those needs as well. Lo and behold, the following year, COVID hit. Thank goodness the BOE structured the funding in two parts because the emergency did happen. With an, empty, with an empty high school and an uncertain 2021 school year, this BOE member who publicly attacked another member for fiscal irresponsibility still wanted to fund the rest of the wellness center. Smarter heads prevailed and that funding was postponed, giving the district some financial breathing room. The balance has been added to this year's budget and the majority of the BOE again voted yes. Fiscal responsibility is one of the duties of the board. Many of the families in our community are struggling financially. If a member or members of the board cannot relate or at least take that into consideration, to take these struggles into consideration when structuring the budget, the community suffers. I understand that we all have issues and projects we are passionate about. I myself am certainly no angel when it comes to communication at times. While it is certainly valid for current BOE members to support and seek new trustees, that is not what occurred. A current member is spreading misinformation with clear ill intent toward another board member. What kind of model does it set for our students and community for the BOI, BOE to allow such verbal attacks to happen without comment or sanction? Your violence is silence and calls into question your fitness as a body to oversee the education of our children, especially during such a tumultuous time. We desperately need a cohesive board and we need you to hold each other accountable. Thank you. Thank you. The next comment is from Stana. Hi, I'm Stana Marquardt. I live in New Falls. Um, sorry. Um, my comment is about one of the things that's on the agenda tonight, and that is. Um, Donna, can you just get speaker closer okay. to the microphone? My, my comment, sorry. My name is Donna Weisberg. I'm from New Paltz. I'm commenting on the um, anti-racism policy that's going to be discussed again tonight. Um, there's a lot of changes that have been made, and um, I'm eagerly looking forward to hearing um, explanations for why some of these changes were made. I will say that, you know, I don't feel any policy should pass without accountability in it and with the operational plan attached at the same time. Otherwise, we're, we're right back where we started. Thank you. Thank you, Stana. Well, I have a comment here I'm going to read. Uh, dear New Paul Central School Board of Education and REACT, 
First, I appreciate your service, particularly in your roles as stewards of public education in the community in such a challenging time. I am ready with concerns and questions about the proposed Board of Ed anti-racist policy 3430, scheduled for further reading tonight. I have watched, uh, tonight having watched and listened to the most recent discussion from May 5th, 2021. I have amended my earlier communication to reflect that discussion. I heard the discussion begin with concerns for affordability and concerns for comfort of staff. Can the district afford not to engage only in anti-racism? Can the district afford the very risk of more loss of lawsuits? And where is the concern for comfort or simple safety and belonging for students and families of color? I urge the board to move not at the pace of continued harm, but the speed of remedy and change. Who is, decided, who is this charged with deciding compliance and alignment with anti-racist values? If it's the Board of Ed, what qualifies them? A majority white group specifically to identify and assess racism within the district and among themselves. If it is the administration and principals who are charged again, what can be shared to the public that specifically demonstrates this capacity and competence? Operationally, it is common practice in higher education for teachers and staff to generate individual statements of professional commitment to equity and inclusion commitments that outline how these values are rooted in the pedagogy and expressed in practice. As a nation, millions have poured into bias training as a nation, millions have been poured into bias training in schools and business. Hiring an outside expert is no guarantee of change behavior of those in power or increased safety for those targeted for racial harm. As mounting lawsuits over racial discrimination and harassment prove, when will knowing better, when will knowing better look like doing better and how will students and families experience this change? The current policy draft omits support for hiring employees of color in the policy. Where is the recognition of the district's responsibility to provide appropriate support and protection from predictable racist backlash for those on the front line of racial equity? Racism thrives in preoccupations over hierarchy and business as usual structures and decision making by those furthest from lived experiences and direct impacts of racism. Which and how often have members of the majority white board devoted their time to attending REACT meetings to listen and learn and take direction from REACT members, parents, and students. There was much discussion over language and definitions. Some of this is sensible. Some of this is also reflective of white supremacy culture and action. I urge the DOE to reflect on its own behavior as it actively manifests several characteristics of white supremacy culture, especially paternalism, power hoarding, and right to comfort. I urge you to post this key resource that outlines clearly these characteristics as well as antidotes to these behaviors on the district website, webpage. Without knowing the behaviors that nourish white supremacy culture, that we all engage in, there will be, in fact, more window dressing and little hope of realizing the aspirational goals of this policy. I hope the DOE achieves integrity in this vital policy and removes the barriers generated by the Board of Ed's own thinking behavior that prevent it from being a real tool for transformative change. I look forward to hearing these questions addressed and discussed in detail. Uh, thank you, Sophia Skiles. Uh, that will take us to item number seven, the superintendent's reports and discussion items. I just wanted to uh, extend a, a heartfelt thank you to the community members who came out to vote yesterday evening, or yesterday all day. We're grateful for your support and look forward to the road ahead as we support our students in the community. Thank you. Uh, that will take us to item number. 
I'm sorry, I don't have your name, but if you'd like to speak, I think I'll, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't, it's okay, I just don't have your name on the list. No, you can, you can speak. Thank you. My name is Eli Pasira. I live in Garden, New York. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, secondly, also to thank you on the board for the the work that you do. It's a challenge. You know, take a lot of abuse, and uh, it's not easy. But I, I'm grateful for the fact that you stand up and you do it. Uh, I came here tonight to talk about a safety and health issue. I think that all of you are well aware of the fact that safety and health issues trump everything that happens in a school. It takes precedence over curriculum, it takes precedence over classroom management, it even takes precedence over contract issues. I believe there's a serious safety and health issue that is being uh, lived out in our school district, and that involves mask wearing among school-aged children. Uh, the masks that the children are wearing, number one, are cloth masks. Uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is responsible for all safety and health issues in the workplace here in America, does not even consider the cloth masks to be PPE, that's personal protective equipment. So in a sense, they're really useless. Beyond that, they do consider the N95 as PPE, but if you look at the label on the N95 box, it says specifically and clearly, the N95 mask does not protect against the COVID virus. That's SARS-CoV-2. Just look at the box, you'll see that it does not protect against the COVID virus. Beyond that, children of young, uh, young children, particularly young school-aged children, rarely, if ever, contract COVID. And if they do, if they do get sick, the symptoms are mild, and they have virtually 100% recovery rate. Experts are agreeing that during this COVID period, the children are experiencing much increased social, psychological, emotional problems, including self-harm and suicide. The mask wearing, there's consensus on this as well, the mask wearing only exacerbates these issues, which also includes self-harm and suicide, by the way. So we've got children who really have no risk of contracting COVID, nor of spreading COVID, and we are forcing them to wear masks, which are only exacerbating the problem, and continuing to create isolation and anxiety among the students. All of what I'm talking about comes from PubMed, peer-reviewed studies. PubMed's the largest repository of peer-reviewed studies in America. You can check this out for yourself. So I guess I'm just here to plead with you to end this policy. Uh, the children are suffering, it's harmful to the children, and I know many of you are thinking, well, you know, the Board of Health says this and the CDC says that. The CDC has flip-flopped on this issue a number of times and has recently come out with new guidelines. And the Board of Health or the Health Commissioner, whoever it is, they can take their position, but you folks here, the Board of Ed, you're the responsible people. You have the legal, moral, and ethical responsibility to protect our children. If you know that something harmful is being done to our children, you have the obligation to stand up and say something about it. You can't say, I'm just following orders, and I'm just following the guidelines. I put it out here tonight. You can do the research yourself. You can see that the face masks are harming the children. There is no benefit to the children, and it really needs to stop. So I'm just putting it out there for your consideration, and I hope that you'll do the research. You don't have to believe me. Go to PubMed, do the research on the masks, do the research on the children not contracting COVID, not being contagious, and always recovering, and always having mild symptoms. So that's pretty much what I have to say about this, and I appreciate you listening. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Sorry, I didn't see your name was signed up, so I do apologize for that. That is going to take us to item number eight, board communications. Um, I just want to also echo what uh, the superintendent said, uh, thanking the community for coming out, passing the budget so overwhelmingly. And I would like to thank uh, all the candidates for being willing to step up and serve this community. So thank you. Uh, board members, does anybody else have anything they would like to say?
Thanks everybody that hung around last night. It was a late night. That will take us to item number nine, minutes of the meeting. Recommendation that the New Paul Central School Board of Education accept the minutes of the workshop meeting of May 5th, 2021. Can I have a motion to accept those minutes? Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item passes 7-0. That takes us to item number 10, the financial reports. Can I have a motion to accept the treasurer report for April 2021? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 7-0. That will take us to the personal consent agenda, item number 11. 11.1. Uh, right, this is an instructional appointment for our substitute. A recommendation that New Paul Central School Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Angela Urbina Medina, does hereby appoint uh, Jessica Blonder as a substitute teacher. Can I have a motion to accept? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. That will take us to item 11.2, the instructional resignation for the purpose of retirement. Recommendation that the New Paul Central Schools Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Angela Urbina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby accept the resignation of the following instructional employee for the purpose of retirement. That's Mary Holmes, uh, retired for 13 years in the district. Can I have a motion to accept that retirement? So moved. So moved. Discussion. Thank, Thank you so much. Enjoy your retirement. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. Appreciate your service and you will be missed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. That takes us to item 11.3, the instructional resignation for the purpose of retirement. Uh, recommend, a recommendation that the New Paul Central School Board of Education upon the recommendation of Angela Abina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby accept the resignation of the following instructional employee for the purpose of, reti purpose of retirement. Uh, special Education Teacher uh, Rebecca Masters with 29 years of service in the district. Can I have a motion to accept the retirement? Second. Discussion. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you Ms. Masters. Uh, you will be missed. Appreciate your service to the kids, both Ms. Holmes and Ms. Masters, to the children of this district. Can I have a moment? Oh, oh, sorry, are we all? Uh, can I have all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. That will take us to item. Can I have a motion to accept item 11.4 through 11.13? So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. That will take us to old business and item 12.1. We have the third reading of policy 3430, the anti-racism policy. Uh, we left this policy off uh, last meeting and uh, Ms. the superintendent uh, was gonna take a look at it. We asked her, you know, we discussed it. She has made some edits to the policy, so I would love for us all to engage in some sort of discussion Board members, who wants to jump right in? This is the uh, anti That's correct. Yeah, um, my, my question is, is this a, a lot, what looks like a lot of changes? So Diana, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing. I don't know if anybody else is having a hard time hearing. Can we all, yeah, just talk close to the microphones. Yeah. Just talk right next to the mic, Diana. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, it's very hard to hear. So yes, I have questions. Um, for the superintendent for the pretty much all of the changes that have been made if we can go through them line by line sure. and explain 
why why they have been um, uh, changed or removed and so on. Sure. So beginning with uh, the heading of purpose, the language as a school community, we wish to promote community education and dialogue about racism, its causes and effects through a variety of channels. This was moved from the training and professional development section. I thought that it was more appropriate to be in this uh, section under the heading of purpose. In the sentence that followed, uh, there was a redaction of, there was a strikeout for the, the purpose of this policy and I consolidated um, those two sentences into one. So if we through this policy, we will continue to examine our practices in an effort to eliminate all forms of racism from the district in conjunction with related vehicles. Policy communication. The third, second bullet. There's a strikeout to the sentence, ideally all racial equity teams. Uh, that sentence I removed as that was a process. The language related to process and from my perspective, from a leadership perspective, what needs to be stated was stated sufficiently in the first sentence and how it, how it took place and the purpose of the, the relationship and the relationship building, what was to be gained, I didn't feel was appropriate for a policy. In the next section, Leadership and administration. The Board of Education shall be mindful of their commitment to anti racist practices when making decisions. And there was a great deal that I took out the uh, six bulleted sections that fell underneath. I thought that that language was actually limited because. I believe that we should be aware of anti-racist practices in any and everything that we do, and I wouldn't want to be limited to only thinking about these uh, questions to the board about community engagement or data um, or implementation or accountability or analysis when this should be part of our thought process as a school community throughout um, our instructional practices, uh, throughout our engagement, throughout policy, when we're talking about discipline, when we're talking about assessment. So I felt like it was language that was actually limited by delineating when we should think about something, when we should think about it in, in a more comprehensive manner. That is my thought. And when, when we had this discussion in the last meeting, I was asked to go back to look at the policy through the lens of, of what is um, appropriate and what is achievable and reasonable and measurable and how accountability can take place. And that's how I went through the language here. Leadership going back and forth between my copy of the this here. So then continuing, um, the administration I added and the Board of Education because this is a collaborative district-wide uh, initiative where we are partners in the work and it needed to be reflected in the items that we delineated here, leadership and administration. So, from top to bottom, in all kinds of ways. Curriculum and instruction. There was a consolidation of 
some of the language that appeared in the second, the third and fourth bullet, and a retooling of it. Um, and some of that is reflected in the second bullet. The use of culturally diverse curriculum materials should be prioritized. The Board of Education and Administration should support the timeline established for a systematic K-12 curriculum audit. So when I, I, when I was looking at the, the rollout and I was asked to start developing a timeline for implementation, um, there, there are certain necessary steps that, that have to take place. Um, and aside from the professional development work that has to take place and the, the conversation and the establishment of purpose, there, there is also a need to look at the nuts and bolts of what we do in the classroom. And that has to take place through an audit of our current curriculum, which is really a very expansive, uh, multi-year process. And I wanted that language to be included in here because I see that as being an absolutely necessary uh, part of the work that needs to take place. The third bullet where I had a strikeout of all curriculum material shall be examined for racial bias, I just found that to be close to impossible to achieve. Because at the end of the day, in my mind, what we have to do is establish purpose and understanding uh, amongst all members of our school community and, and with the expectation that, that this lens is going to be part of everything that we do. But for us to, to examine all materials for racial bias is an immeasurable uh, goal. It, it's almost impossible to achieve. Uh, as having been a classroom teacher, I know that even working within a series, uh, a curriculum, a scoping sequence that we all as, as uh, uh, educational professionals sometimes supplement, add in, take out uh, materials that help to facilitate better understanding. And it's my expectation that when that's done, it's done with this third off, this, this this lens that, that we need to develop and sort of hone so that we are using it um, with that in, a, in a manner that's not really even going to require a great deal of thinking or conversation. That's, that's the aspirational goal. Cross-curricular and cross-racial learning opportunities should be encouraged and inclusive of extracurricular activities. Um, that was a retooling of some of the language that existed and that I um, reorganized. The final bullet, uh, reduce reliance on standardized measures of success that have been shown to be both discriminatory and of limited value in identifying ability predicting success. I wasn't sure what standardized measures we were referring to. Uh, because uh, if, we're, if we're talking about formative or summative assessments or grade level benchmarks, I just, I wasn't clear what the tool was. And the language could be added back or some shape, form thereof. It's just, I just wasn't clear what measures were being referred to in that book. The training and professional development. All board members, faculty, staff, and administrators shall engage with ongoing training and anti-racism practices. The training should include historical context and identify why the outcomes have been harmful on the individual and systemic level. I, I, I basically took um, 
the four bullets that were here and consolidated them into one, what I thought was a cohesive and comprehensive statement about what the training and professional development goals are. You know, it's been my experience that policies that are effective are easy to understand, that they're not too wordy and too complex, um, that they become prohibitive and bogged down in um, the, how things should be facilitated. So that was my approach to the reorganization of that section. And the final bullet, promote community, was moved to purpose. Uh, policy enforcement accountability and transparency. Uh, the second bullet, I have a note here to myself about the, the data that's being referred to, the staff shall collect, review, and provide an annual report to the Board of Education with data regarding racial disparities. I'm not clear about where that information would come from, given that most of what we would see would not be available to teachers in the classroom. It would be on an administrative level. So I wasn't clear about how the staff would be able to gather this information um, and we can have conversation about what was meant there and perhaps once I have a better understanding of it, adjust them and move forward from there. Um, and like I said, I know at first glance it looks like I, I went through with a red pen. Really, I want this policy to work. I want to work collaboratively to, to achieve the goals that we've identified here. And in order for us to do that, we have to have understanding about how it's done, you know, who's responsible, um, and we all have to have clarity about you know, the goals we're doing. Uh, and I think I had one more comment, and that was still policy and enforcement. Uh, District-wide reporting protocol. So that was the third bullet. For the most part, um, the, the, the data and the reporting that's being referred to here is uh, part of the, the DASA reporting process and training. And I have heard that there is a need for um, additional training, um, additional communication about the reporting process, um, availability of the forms, uh, a better understanding of how to report, when to report, uh, where does the report go, just all of the logistics about a student or a, a parent, and, and how do they gain access to this information? Uh, we certainly can make uh, that make adjustments to the reporting process, make available um, the information that that is needed with regard to how to access the forms and how to report incidents and, and um, where that information would be made available for, for uh, students as well as adults in the school community. But there, there is a process in place, and uh, that was the notation that I made here. And the final bullet there was each school and district shall ensure that there are various, including anonymous, means for students and staff to report racism. Uh, my understanding is that 
that process and procedure is in place. And please keep in mind that I'm still shy of a year here. And there's a great deal that I learn every day. So if, if this is, you know, if I'm way off base in any direction about what it is that, that I think, uh, feel free to, to school me. And, you know, that's, that's part of the process. Thank you. So, I just have a, a follow-up with that. So, in order for this to be policy, um, it's it's not going to pass without accountability. So, are we going to go back and work on that on, on this entire policy? Because there must be account an accountability component, along with process and procedures and best practices. If these things are not present, and the policy really has no teeth. So how do we move forward with, is, is it going to be like another read? Is it going to go back to yeah. react? And I, I think, you know, we, we certainly can have another read. If there is a recommendation or a suggestion on, on what it is that, um, that we can add, in, in the realm of uh, accountability. Yeah. I think we should also uh, maybe include a timeline. Yes. For everything. Yeah. That would be helpful. Yeah. I, I just need that. Uh, <laughs> like a timeline to lay some stuff out because clearly, as you mentioned, there's a lot of stuff here. So to hold ourselves accountable, we should have a specified, you know, timetable of when we're going to take care of certain things. Can I, can I make two possible um, language suggestions for that? Um, that under policy enforcement, under that section... I'm sorry, that, Bianca. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll go to the that, that under, under, the to, under policy enforcement, that there be something saying uh, a timeline for policy implementation and responsibility will be developed um, so that it's clear for everyone, like who's implementing which parts. I don't know if that's appropriate for policy, but I, I think it's important that there's like a, that it's laid out. Mm -hmm. um, and also, that efforts shall be made to include these priorities in the evaluative criteria for all staff, because I know that that's not so easily done. It might involve negotiations, but I think that as contracts come up or, or uh, evaluations are renegotiated, that that this needs to be spelled out because people, you know, people respond. To, if this is what's expected of you, if this is how you're being evaluated, it becomes a priority for people, you know, for teachers, for bus drivers, for everyone, for all staff. I'm wondering what everyone thinks about that. Adding about those caveats, it, it adds a layer of accountability and, and prioritizes it. You know, I I agree with you, uh, but I I would like to add that as we identify our anti-racism policy and the anti-racism and equity work as being a, a priority and a district initiative, then it would be the expectation that, um, you know, until such time we're putting the flag on the ground saying success, that, there, that this is going to be part of what it is that we need to see. You know, in our classrooms, in the curriculum, in the work that we do, we do things with our students. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about teacher evaluation, the uh, support of district initiatives is, is part of the whole package. So I don't know necessarily that it would have to be negotiated because it's already encumbered in the evaluation process. Even, even if it was part of the timeline, because it's going to take time to get people to that point. So yeah. even if it was on the timeline, that by at this point, mm -hmm. you know, this will, even if under, I know it's on the Danielson rubric where it says, um, you know, supporting district initiatives, if those words could be inserted, mm -hmm. you know, including, uh -huh. just so that it's, it, it's highlighted and people yeah. know that that's the expert, anybody new coming in. Mm -hmm. um, I understand what you mean. And I just had a, just a few other questions. Um, under 
uh, under leadership and administration, where it says, um, the Board of Education and Administration shall partner to implement alternative discipline processes. I'm wondering if it should say, with the... I'm just trying to catch oh, very well. It's the one, two, three, fourth bullet under leadership and administration. Okay, so I'm wondering, instead of the board, and the board of Education and Administration shall partner, if it should say, with the support of the BOE, the administration shall implement, only because I worry that that gives the Board of Education the power to implement discipline. And, you know, I think, Angela, you've said before, this is a policy not just for this board, for, but for boards to come. And it worries me to give that power to someone other than the people who are actually implementing this. Um, and under um, the board of the, the, skip a bullet, I can't count right now. <laughs> the Board of Education and Administration shall commit the necessary efforts and resources. Um, again, I think it should say with the support of the BOE, the administration shall commit the necessary efforts and resources. Um, only because the board is not involved in recruiting. So, however, we can just word that to make it clear that, that the board is not, act, you know, that we're committing the resources, whatever's needed to do it, but the board is not actually recruiting. Okay, and then, can I keep going, or <laughs> anybody else want I can, I can stop and come back to it. Right, I'll keep going. Um, I, I, I really heard what you said about um, a, the curriculum audit piece. I'm wondering if something should be in there. So, where are you? I think I have to, I have to find my place. Beyond, are you on the uh, curriculum? Under curriculum and instruction. Um, the Board of Education and Administration should support the timeline established for a systematic K-2 curriculum audit. Um, I just, you know, so an open audit sounds like a one-time thing, but I'm assuming that there needs, that there'll be something in place for as new curriculum is acquired or in the future. And I, I understand what you're saying, you can't, the idea of vetting every single thing. So would language make sense, a plan shall be developed to vet future curriculum for bias to the extent possible, or just a rubric for, I mean, I don't want to get too granular, but just something to make it clear that it's not a one-time audit, that this is ongoing. I think with that, too, as far, what I do like about this timeline established, I think it's important that we establish a timeline, because this is a big project, which is a good project, but it's going to be broken down to grade levels, I think what's important that we do have some sort of timeline to hold ourselves accountable that we're doing this, this parts of the year, this is going to happen the following year. But I, I do agree with you about a continual, I mean, it shouldn't be a one-time only thing, but I do think we need to have something in about a timeline for a curriculum audit. Well, yeah, I, I, I think that that would be something that would be an appropriate addition. And you know, writing curriculum is an ongoing process. Um, so reviewing curriculum would be systematic and ongoing as well. Yeah, I think that word systematic is great there because yeah. that then there is some kind of rubric or, or there, there's a yeah. standard. So but those do exist in some of the tools that I've seen, some of the, uh, like Steinhardt, they have some great tools for reviewing curriculum and identifying uh, aspects of, uh, of bias within the tools that are used in the classroom. So, Angela, with, with the curriculum audit, you know, K-12, and then you have a variety of different subjects, I mean, I mean, three to five years, is that pretty much something you were thinking in that ballpark? Absolutely. I mean, minimally five years. Yeah, you have to, if you're talking about five subject area, you know, across multiple grade levels, um, and for the most part, much of this work um, 
can't even take place during the school day because of the lack of substitute coverage. So, you know, even the structure of how the work takes place is something that we have to, to give some uh, thought to because we absolutely need teachers to be involved in the process. Um, and, you know, the more collaborative the effort is, uh, the more sustainable the result will be. But it's, it's a process that's going to take time. Because I think the, the timeline is going to be a timeline until the timeline has been updated. And, you know, it's an annual timeline. Yeah. Like, kind of like painting your house. You yeah. start, you know, it's got to keep going. I mean, maybe under maybe under where under um, accountability and transparency. I think the the language I had suggested about a timeline, perhaps it could just include something similar to what is in um, another report out piece that that uh, you know progress on the timeline can be reported out. I'm not sure what you think of inappropriate every so often. Um, And then the last suggestion I have was under curriculum instruction. You know, in our policy manual, we mandate civics instruction, we, we mandate prevention instruction. We had touched on it a few weeks ago, um, the policy committee possibly looking at this, but under curriculum instruction, um, would it be appropriate to include a mandate that black history be taught? Um, because we're talking about you know, culturally diverse curriculum, but just specifically, I think, you know, unless that should be a standalone policy, you know, we do have standalone policies on those other things I mentioned. I mean, I but think it would also be an appropriate place to add them to the existing policy. So you add, add it under under that other part of the policy manual? Okay. I have uh, under training and professional development. Uh, it's not wouldn't be part of the policy, but it's mentioned all board members, faculty, staff, and administrators shall engage in ongoing and recurring training. Uh, just from the Board of Ed, is there any way like, we can take a look at that sooner than later with uh, like new board members coming in and we can kind of disseminate some information? I mean, while I've done lots of stuff through my school, I've not done any specific other than the workshop we did this winter, the Undoing Racism workshop, if we could get some dates so we could get the board kind of going with that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And I only got like, 25% of what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I think when people speak, they should take yeah, the mask down because I can't understand it. Yeah. Okay. We can start uh, training the school board. Sure. So when they summon, like, I think the board members coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I had to use the mic and I was told that no one could hear me. What I had said was, just from the point of view of the board members, if we could start getting some dates together this summer for the board to begin the training that's specified in the training and professional development in anti-racism policy practices. Yes. So we have some new board members coming in, and we have some board members that still could, uh, need to do the undoing racism. Uh, does anybody else have anything they'd like to bring up? I just have a, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just have a quick question about the undoing racism. Do we know if it's in person again, or do they plan on doing that in person? I'm not quite sure. There is one going on, um, I believe, in June, and I believe it's in person. I think they just started it now. Um, so I'm not sure if Oh, okay. Is it going to be local people? I'll, I'll, um, I'll send it. I, I think I saw it on Facebook. Okay. Well, thank you. Mike, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, I just want to talk about a couple of items. Um, so one is about a specific bullet point uh, under training and professional development. Um, we have crossed out the district will acknowledge, utilize, and celebrate endemic anti-racist practices of practitioners. I propose to keep that in. I'll explain a little bit about the thinking there. Really, the thinking there is to view the people we already have on board who have these skills as an asset and utilize those assets in the development. And then as we do this training, as we do the professional development, we think about it like it's an investment in the district. 
so that we are training people and bringing them up to speed and then allowing them the freedom to take that training and apply it throughout the district. Um, you know, these are somewhat soft concepts, but I just want to make it clear that that's something that's an expectation out of this policy, which is to look at these as investments and develop the internal capacity. Because obviously, you know, we're thinking about this policy, we should always think about policy in a completely person agnostic way, right? Because not everybody's going to be here forever, you can't count on that. We should think about continuously replenishing our internal capacity to teach these concepts, and that's the idea behind that one. So, similar to when you go to a training and you bring back the training manual and the manual goes on the shelf, it's like shelf art, we're talking about taking those practices, using them, you know, improving on them, celebrating them. Yeah, yeah, and, and then a, sec a secondary part, which is to take people who have become particularly expert practitioners in their own classrooms, in their own settings, and, and utilizing them as resources, as assets, to explain why the thing they're doing that's unique in their classroom is working based on that training, so that maybe they can do their own internal training and we'll take that practice and then we'll develop it out further in the district. It's just to encourage, basically, uh -huh. to allow people to be their own labs, yeah. their own incubators of ideas that work, and then vet them. Of course, you know, I'm not saying you just go, go wild let them try everything anything you want, but to take the people who are particularly skilled and utilize their assets to develop it throughout the rest of the district. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I would like to uh, take what you said and maybe reword it a little bit here. Yeah, that's have fine. Have that language back in. Does that, that make sense what you're saying? Uh, second part, so talking about accountability, the one thing you should keep in mind is really that accountability comes from us. You know, we are the mechanism of accountability, the primary mechanism, the board is. Um, the board sets policy, it's the superintendent's job that they implement this policy. If the policy is not being implemented properly or effectively, it is on the board to make sure the superintendent is held accountable for that. Now, that, that's not to say we just keep it completely loose in terms of accountability. I think we can have some elements in there about um, that annual, semi-annual check-ins, reports, other ways that create those those road markers for the board to stay on task as well, so that we know that we have an obligation, so that then the public can say, hey, by the way, you were supposed to reevaluate your anti-racism policy twice per year and you haven't done it yet. Right? That way, that also holds us accountable. So I think we can have those kinds of markers in the policy to let some of that accountability and not let it just slip. Mike, can you give an example, just an example of how that would sound like in the policy, like how you would write that, just um, so I understand? I, I think it could be something as simple as, and we can talk about the timing, that this policy will be, on whatever time frame, whether annually, biannually, will be reviewed in a public meeting where we will have a report on what progress has been made toward implementing the policy. Right, okay. so then we can actually come back in a board meeting and Angela can report out and say, in regard to the anti-racism policy, here are all the things we've done since the last time we met to put the policy into practice. And here's an update on how those things are done. So similar to the, the hiring policy, I think that has some, I think there's something similar in that too, that there's a yearly, that the board will review the policy yearly. Yeah. That's actually just to review all of the, during a board meeting once a year, just to review all of the, um, pieces of this and right. But I think, I think the things that we've done different is the public review. So the so the policy committee, you know, reviews policies, but what Mike I think is saying is that it's a public review. You know, you're almost putting like a like a tab there, a yearly public review, rather than just something you know board shall review, which is which is different, right? Because that can be done within the policy committee. Is that my understanding what you're saying? I couldn't really hear what you said very well. I think you need to take the mask off. I, can't, I, can't I, I think, Mike, what you're saying is what's different from the policy reviews that happen in the policy committee is that public piece, that there's like a marker there that every year there's a public review. So I think that's, in my understanding, that's how it differs from what the policy committee does, you know, within their smaller committee. So we're talking about a self-assessment. Right, a, dis a district assessment of our uh, work towards achieving the goals established in the policy. And as far as check-ins go, if we could do something more than once a year, I think we need to do multiple times. So, 
Definitely. I think, I think that's built into the timeline piece we talked yeah. about. So a timeline and then built into that would be, you know, progress reports if it's every quarter or once a month, or I'm not sure what the appropriate time is, but some, some kind of a regular check-in. But I, I, I just want to be, I just want to be mindful of the fact that, to me, what we put in here matters, and I don't want to add language that is going to be difficult to uh, abide by. So, um, you know, I, I report out uh, weekly to the board, and um, certainly if there are initiatives that are taking place that are connected to our anti-racism work, then that would be something that I would want to report out, we would want to report out as a district and celebrate. Um, but, you know, perhaps a, a biannual review, you know, similar to um, two semesters, you know, semester one, semester two, um, it, those could be the benchmarks at that halfway point, you know, just take the temperature of where we are and, and move in the ball forward. Thank you, Angela. So where does that leave us right now? What does everybody want to do with the policy? Where, where does that leave us right now? There's been some discussion that we're going to incorporate things. I think that, that I've made note of, of some of what we've discussed here that will, I'm also going to be in conversation with REAC about um, aspects of language that, that um, with regard to accountability measures, and then we're going to come back and do the um, So this will come back next meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that we're, we're close, closer to a finished product than than not, um, with you know, with some changes and modifications, the addition of the timeline, I I feel like it's developing um, into a workable policy. Is that what this felt here? I think she said close to a workable, and that she wants to work on it for two, two weeks and bring it back to the next meeting. On a slightly different topic that may be somewhat related is climate survey because it has some of the components of what we're trying to achieve in there that when it was done in 2019 were lacking. So, um, you know, my, my, my suggestion, and I know we have a lot on the plate, is that we did another climate survey done. I wish we could get it done before school was done. Just to get a baseline of what has occurred for the students um, during this pandemic and this academic year. So do you think that's something that might be able to happen before the end of the year? I, 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 I wouldn't take it off the table as being possible. Yeah. There's, there's a new tool that I, I spoke about um, last week, thought exchange, different than a survey uh, where I'm, we're setting the stage and asking the questions and people are responding to uh, the questions that we've asked. Um, with an exchange, you're, you're asking a question and you're having people respond to it and then uh, their responses are ranked and completely confidential and you really get a, a broader understanding of, of what people are thinking and it's not limited. And if many people are thinking about this one particular aspect or if they've had multiple people have had an experience that falls into this category, then uh, it would be highlighted and starred by other people. And we would get a better sense of um, what the collective experience has been and uh, without, with anonymity and without limitations. Uh, I'm going to be using that tool to send out to um, parents who have opted to uh, be remote only 
asking them about, you know, what, what was uh, in their thought process and why did they make the decision to, to stay. And, and I think the climate survey, um, I think it should be done annually, in the, the, the climate survey, because it, it's, it's a constant change. Is it a thought annual? We have, we have it? We have it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so they wouldn't be right. And I mean, I'm sure because, you know, COVID changes, they might occur. You know, I thought it was way too much. I mean, obviously not that in 2020, but it I mean, they kind of just started. But a couple I think of it might have been every two years. Yeah. So oh. one, one thing I would encourage, you know, if we do do the climate survey, let's, I would highly recommend that we reuse same survey or nearly the same survey instrument when we use through panorama research mm -hmm. reuse the same survey instrument so that we begin to collect some longitudinal data um, i don't want you know if we keep changing the climate survey every single time we send a new one out we're never going to have a trend on what's happening in our district. That's a great so angela just following up on what diana was saying about a, um, a um, survey before the end of the year if that's not doable is there any way we could do like a like a, a short survey of like maybe graduating seniors, like on how they feel the climate was, is, you know, in the, you know, just, I mean, I know we did, I'm just thinking a small example. Mm -hmm. And that would be like a, gra I thought we did a graduating senior survey, but, you know, we could glean some information on the climate um, from just them, uh -huh. you know, I mean, just to get something done before the end sure. of the year. I don't know if what you're, I, you know, I, what Diana was suggesting is too much to do. I, I, I don't think that it's an impossible okay. task uh, to execute between now and the end of the year. Okay. You know, the framework is already in place because the survey was administered uh, previously. And using the same, having um, members of the community respond to the same questions will at least give us baseline to measure uh, their responses against previous responses even though the pool is different. Um, so, I, you know, the framework is in place, so, yeah, I think we can do it. I just would be curious to see their opinions on, you know, what the culture is at the high school, because a lot of students, you know, won't say, um, but if it's like an anonymous type thing, I think that would be, um, you know, helpful moving forward sure. because they've witnessed things for four years that you know we might not know. Mm -hmm. So their feedback would be valuable. So we're all in agreement that policy, uh, the, the anti-racism policy, is going to come back in two weeks. Yes. Does that need a motion? To, or would you say we're bringing it back? Sure. Does React need before? Then, Diana, what's that? Does REACT meet before no, our next meeting or no? Exactly. Uh, I don't have a joint meeting. On the 8th. So they'll have a chance to review and stuff. Okay. Well, our next meeting is June 2nd. Second. Second. So if we are going to discuss this at the next meeting, um, the board meeting is June 2nd, and the REACT board meeting is June 8th. So what should we do? Do you want to discuss it at that meeting on the 8th? We have to make a decision. Trying to figure out how REACT can get together with the superintendent um, before the next, next scheduled meeting, which is kind of after we meet again. I mean, so, even if the communication takes place via email, yeah, we're, we're talking about a kind of a limited conversation, you know, just speaking a bit about that particular area. I think that can take place before the second. Yeah, but even, even if you could make your adjustments and then email that out to me, um, explaining, you know, what we're trying to do right. and, and, and see if maybe we can get, or, you know, as a last ditch effort, maybe we have to do a zone meeting. Yeah, the, la the last time around, when I came out of the policy committee, we did react feedback over at Lebanon. 
you know, just right. drafted it up and set it out. And got the feedback that way. Do that again. All right, so the superintendent's going to make her adjustments, uh, get it back to React, and it can be done via either uh, an in-person meeting or over a Google Doc, and then this document is going to come back to us on June 2nd. Okay. So that will take us to item 12.2. This is the uh, third reading of policy 7680, the independent educational evaluation policy. Now, what were the changes we had made to this in the second reading? So I. Um, Angel, do you want me to speak to that or do you? Okay. So there's there's just one piece in this policy that keeps giving me pause, and it's the it's the piece that um, let me just find it. Okay. So it's it, it's when a parent asks for an independent evaluation, the district has to give the parent the criteria under which the evaluation has to be obtained, and this policy says that the location and qualifications of the independent examiner have to be exactly the same as the district location and examiner. So my concern is that that would be very limiting for families, that it would preclude them from getting an IE because it would mean it had to be done on district premises and someone with um, a school psychology certification. So if we change the word um, that, that, the, that the qualifications of the examiner and the location have to be too comparable, that that might not be so limiting, but that has to be run past the attorney. So if we could table that, pending that clarification, table this third read pending that clarification. So you want to table this third read and then bring this back in another meeting? Yeah, just to, just to get clarification if that were comparable, okay. we'll pass, right. because it seems like that would address the concerns. And okay, I'm okay with that. Is everybody else okay that we table this and to make sure that works out? I, I agree. I think um, the part about almost it almost seems to require that it's the same location, which seems odd because you know some I, a lot of these evaluations have to be done in the office premises of the evaluator, who's an independent psychologist in those times. Okay, so we'll bring this back for a fourth read. That's going to take us to item 13, new business. Item 13.1, request for approval of the Committee on Special Education recommendations and student placements. Recommendation that the following resolution be approved. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the New Paul Central School District approve the Committee on Special Education and the Committee on Preschool uh, Special Education and the recommendations of student placements. Can I have a motion to accept these recommendations and placements? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Item 13.2, a request for approval to establish student scholarship recommendation. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the New Paul Central School District, upon the recommendation of Superintendent Angela Urbina Medina, does hereby approve the establishment of the Nat Natural Science Award in memory of at Katrini Lamas in the amount of $400. This award is for a student who has shown a strong interest in natural sciences related to ecology and who has actively demonstrated a concern for the environment and who intends to continue to study and apply that knowledge to better condition, to the better condition of the earth and all life that share it. Can I have a, rec can I have a motion to accept this Request for approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Our discussion? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. To yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. This takes us to item 13.3 budget transfer. Uh, the recommendation that the New Paul Central Schools Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Angela Urbina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby approve the following budget transfer. Uh, There's a transfer of a variety of BOCES equipment, uh, 
uh, in the amount of $235,000. Can I have a motion to accept this budget transfer? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion on the budget transfer? All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion passes 7-0. That takes us to item 13.4. Request for the approval of supplemental memorandum of agreement. Be it resolved upon the recommendation of Angela Urbina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, that the Board of Education does hereby approve a supplemental memorandum of agreement between the New Paul Central School District and the Communication Workers of America AFL CIO Local 1120 CWA dated May 18, 2021, regarding the resignation of two unit members. Be it further resolved that the superintendent is hereby authorized to sign the supplemental memorandum of agreement on behalf of the district. Can I have a motion to accept this uh, SMOA? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's going to take us to 14 other discussion items. Does anybody else, does anybody have some items they would like to bring up for discussion? Yes. Go ahead, Brian. So uh, at the last meeting, there was some discussion about uh, the need to move forward with hiring a new consultant to replace Generation Ready. And I'm just wondering uh, where we are with that. Where, what's our next step? Okay. We can't hear you, Brian. <laughs> Sorry. I, I feel I'd like, like to make a motion that we never hold a meeting in the gym again. <laughs> what? Second. Brian asked where we were with uh, Generation Ready. So at the last meeting, uh, there was some discussion about the need to hire a new consultant to replace Generation Ready. Uh, we need to move forward with that. I'm wondering uh, where we are and what our next steps are. Anybody has any that, we have not met since that meeting, so that's a discussion at the next meeting. Um, and, and maybe it can come sooner than later. I'll keep you posted. Okay. But uh, it's the new once a month, so we have not met since. Okay. But well, we, have to, we, we that do that have the list. At some point, Maria can send us a list of possible. Uh, yeah, we definitely have to list Angela added to that list, yeah. so I think we probably have between four and six to choose from. Okay. So, so maybe we can get that to you before I And maybe we can, we can put that on the agenda for uh, board discussion to pick one of these consultants. Well, the, wait, one item on that though is, so we next meet next meets on June 8th. Right. So okay. Right. So are they going to discuss the list? Yeah. Okay, I'm just I'm just saying that if we do bring it back, maybe let's not bring it back until React meets. Maybe React meets on the 8th. We have a meeting on the 16th. Maybe we'll bring it back on the 16th after the event. Well, uh, if we could also maybe get an uh, item, uh, some agenda items that React would like to discuss with us on June 8th, if that was possible. We could get some, I mean, not a full agenda, but just some sort of agenda items that React would like to discuss with the board so we could maybe do some work on that before the meeting. Unless anybody has anything else to discuss, I'm going to call for a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you for coming out, everybody.